As we come to worship God, let us focus our thoughts and our hearts upon him. Psalm 103, Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Shall we come to God in prayer? Let's all pray. Almighty God, our everlasting Father, We come to you this morning and we recognize our great need of you as we come. We recognize that we cannot do a single thing without your help and strength and power. We know that even in the singing of these wonderful hymns that we have today, in lifting our hearts to you in prayer, in the reading of your word and in the hearing of your word, We need the help of your Holy Spirit. But Lord, we come desiring that. We come longing in our hearts that we would not simply hear one another's voices, but that the voice we shall hear will be your voice speaking to us. We pray that in your great love for us, we've just read that you are a God who is full of compassion and full of love and mercy, slow to anger, abounding in love. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with that confidence. And you have set your seal upon that by sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We thank you for that great pledge of love that he went all the way to Calvary's cross for us. So, Lord, hear our prayers as we gather together this morning. And not us only, but there are people gathered in every place across this land and indeed across the world, many of them in very difficult circumstances, far more difficult than our own. And yet you promise to be with your people where they're gathered in your name. Hear our prayers then and meet with us as we seek you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, our first hymn is number 29, hymn number 29. A great hymn based upon that psalm that we just read is number 29, Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet your tribute bring. Number 29.
Now we've finished the Apostles' Creed, and I did think that that uh, was quite complicated in some places, wasn't it? Especially for the younger children. So I thought today we'd have some stories. And they're stories I haven't told for a very long time. Some of you won't have heard them. Um, I mentioned from the pulpit, Jungle Doctor, and I'm going to tell you some stories that come from Africa. They come from a country called Tanzania and from a missionary called Dr. Paul White, who lived and worked there for a long time. And these are all stories that help us to understand things about the Bible. So here's the first picture. Two monkeys called Toto and Moto. And you can see that they're playing with a coconut because that's what they love to do. I don't know whether anyone ever says to you, you're a little monkey. I think people say that because monkeys get up to a lot of mischief. And so these two monkeys used to get up to a lot of mischief together, Toto and Moto. They were cousins. They were playing with the coconut one day, throwing it to each other, seeing if they could throw it so high that the other one wouldn't be able to catch it. And if he dropped it, oh, then you'd win a point. So they were throwing this coconut to each other and having a great time. And as they did so, they were talking to each other. Hmm, do you remember? Do you remember what great uncle Nayani, he was a very old monkey. Do you remember what great uncle Nayani was telling us the other day? Oh yes. Oh, yes, said Toto. I remember he told us that we've got to keep away from... What was it we've got to keep away from? Oh, we've got to keep away... Some mud? Some mud somewhere? Oh, yes, that's right, said, uh, said Toto. It's that big matope mud. That big, black, down-sucking matope mud. Oh, yes, that's right, that's right. I remember it now. Catch this! And the coconut went sailing through the air. And, oh, dear, poor Toto missed it. And it dropped on the ground. And it bounced. Boing! And then up again. And it bounced again. Boing! And then, splosh! It landed in the mud. Oh, no! Oh, no, it's gone in the mud. What are we going to do now, said Toto. Leave it to me, said Moto. What are you doing, said Toto. Just leave it to me, said Moto. I'm going to get it. But, but, but what, what, if, what if that is a... Oh, don't want to listen to old Uncle Nayani, great Uncle Nayani. Oh, he's always worrying about silly things like that. It's quite all right. Look, I'm in. And I'm next to the coconut. See? No problem. Splosh. He landed in the mud. You see, I can reach it. It's just here. And he reached out and took hold of the coconut. I don't know what you were worrying about, he said. It's just here, look. Got it. We're fine. No problem. Um, Moto? Yeah? Look at your legs. What about my legs? My legs are fine. No, I think. You're sinking. And already, Moto had sunk down to his little monkey calves. Oh, it's okay, he said. It's fine. I'll just step out. So he tried to lift up one leg. And he couldn't. Stuck. Oh, it's okay, he said. I'm sure I'll be able to get out. But by now, he was sunk down to his little monkey 
knees. Try hard, said Toto. Try really hard to lift your leg up. Try one leg at a time and get your leg out. I am trying, said Moto. I'm trying really hard. But by now, he'd sunk down even further. Aha! Ah, ha, ha, ha. I've got it, I know. I know how you can get yourself out of the mud, said Toto. Oh, please tell me, please tell me, said Moto. It's easy. He said, you take hold of your whiskers and you grip them really tightly and you pull. And if you hold on to your whiskers and pull, you will pull yourself out of the mud. Do you think that's going to work? You do. Let's see. So, Moto tried ever so hard. He held on to his little whiskers as really as hard as he could and he concentrated really hard and he started to pull and pull and pull and he, by now he was down to his little monkey tummy. Oh dear, oh dear. He's beginning to panic. He ended up with two hands full of whiskers and then he shouted help. And he had never shouted as loudly as that in his life. Help! And the sound of his voice carried all the way through the jungle. But he was still sinking. Way off in another part of the jungle, two other animals heard his cry. This is Timbo. The elephant. And this is Twiga, the giraffe. And they heard a cry. Did you hear anything? said Timble. Yes, said Twiga, and it sounds very much like Moto. That little monkey is in trouble. We must go and see if we can help him. And so they thundered through the jungle. By now, Moto had sunk down to his little monkey ears and he was beginning to panic. I think I'm going to drown in the mud, he said. I think I'm going under. Hang on there, said Toto. I can hear something. I can hear someone coming. And then the rescue operation was underway. First of all, Tembo stood on the bank and he said to Twiga, you stand out on that little tiny island and reach out your neck as far as it can go and see if you can catch hold of him. By now, the only thing that could be seen was a little monkey paw just reaching out of the mud. But Twiga reached him and pulled him out and suddenly, plop, he came out of the mud. Oh, thank you so much for saving me, said Moto. I will never, ever go near that mud again. And he never did. What's that story all about? Well, it helps us to understand something that God tells us in the Bible. God tells us that all of us are like that little monkey. And all of us get ourselves into some terrible situations because we don't listen to what God says. Just like those monkeys didn't listen to great uncle Nayani, did they? They just went and did whatever they wanted to and they didn't take the warnings and we're the same. And that's what the Bible calls sin. But you know, it also tells us that just as he couldn't get himself out of the mud, we can't get ourselves out of our muddle and our sin. We can't do it ourselves because we're not saved by our own works. The Bible says that we're saved by the grace of God. But the last thing is this. It's a lovely verse in the Bible. It's in Acts chapter 2 and it says this. Everyone 
who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All little Moto had to do was to call out and then he was saved. And that's what we have to do. We call out to God and to the Lord Jesus and we are saved. We're rescued from our sins and we are brought into a safe place. So that's what the story is all about. So perhaps you'll remember that. It's a story called Monkey in the Mud. Well, we're going to read God's Word now. We're going to read from Matthew's Gospel and chapter 9. So let's read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, and beginning to read at the first verse. And we'll see some of those things that we just heard in that little story. Um, we'll find them in this Bible account. Matthew 9, verse 1. Let's hear God's word. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to men. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. We thank God for the reading of his word. And now, shall we come to God in prayer? Let's all pray. O Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your love and mercy you have made a way open for us to come to you. We thank you that we know that when all other ears are deaf to us, there is always one ear that is open. There's always one door that is open for us to come through. We thank you that you are a God who is always ready to hear our cries and our pleas. We thank you that you are never too busy, we are never disinterested we thank you that you are concerned and caring and loving for all that you have made we see that all around us because you provide everything richly in this world so that this world would have enough if it were not for the selfishness and greed of human beings and so lord we do thank you that we can come to you you show us that you are a loving god you show us that you are god who cares and most of all you have sent the lord jesus into the world so that we know 
know that you are a God who has opened up that way, that one way to heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that he alone is the way and the truth and the life and that we cannot come to you except through him. But we thank you that there is a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. We thank you that there is a door that is opened and all may go in. We thank you that Calvary's cross is where we begin when we come as sinners to Jesus. We thank you then for the Lord Jesus and we thank you for all that it means to know him as our saviour, our lord, our friend, our king. We thank you that he has revealed himself in such wonderful ways. We pray that we would have eyes to see it, ears to hear it and hearts that would respond to the good message of the gospel. We thank you that we're living in gospel days and we pray for every opportunity that is had to to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus. We we thank you that there was an opportunity last night with the young people uh, in Swansea and we pray for that meeting and for all others like it where young people, teenagers are able to meet together in order to hear your word. We pray that there might be lasting fruit for your kingdom through the word that was proclaimed then and there might be good friendships established that will be lifelong and helpful. Lord we pray also for the preaching of your word today and in many places we know that your word goes out in the open air regularly and we pray for it and ask that those who hear who would never perhaps uh, set foot in a church of their own volition we pray that they would hear your word and that you would direct them to a place where they would hear the good news of the Lord Jesus but Lord all of this is in vain if your Holy Spirit does not work so we pray so much for that gracious loving Holy Spirit who comes powerfully but silently into our hearts and changes us by his power and by the new birth. We pray that he will take the word of God and make it known to us. We also pray for his continuing work in each one of our lives. We know that there is work to be done in each of us. There are sins that we need to be convicted of and convinced of. There is repentance that we need to engage in. There is sanctification that needs to progress. Lord, there's so much still to prepare us for heaven and to make us more useful here on earth and we pray that your holy spirit would do that pray for those missionaries whom we support we've been especially concerned for the work that goes on in ukraine and in the surrounding countries that have received uh, refugees we thank you lord for what you are continuing to do in that country of ukraine thank you for the pastors that remain even in the most difficult places even in places where the war is fiercest we know that some of your children are there and we pray that your hand will be upon them so that in life or even in death they will be able to bear witness to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus and that others will come to an eternal salvation not just to escape war now but to escape your judgment in the future also pray for those countries that have received the refugees we especially pray for our brother Adam Urban and his wife Dagmara there in Sidlich in Poland we pray for them Lord thank you for the encouragement that they've had recently the baptisms but we also pray for the continuing needs that there are amongst the Ukrainian refugees and then we pray for our own fellowship and we pray for those who are unwell and kept away from us this morning that you will bless them and be with them restore them to good health again we pray that we might see their faces once more and rejoice together and we pray Lord that whatever our particular needs might be that they might be met according to your grace and love in Christ Jesus forgive our many sins we pray for we come in his most precious name amen our next hymn is number 477. It's not a hymn that we sing very often, but it is a, a, a very helpful hymn to focus our thoughts and our prayers upon the, the word of God going out into the world. Number 477, O Lord, our God, arise, the cause of truth maintain, and wide o'er all the peopled world extend her blessed reign 477 <laughs> Thank you. 
if you would turn back with me to that passage that we read in uh, Matthew and chapter 9. Matthew and chapter 9. And particularly this morning we're focusing on verses 9 through to 13. 9 to 13. Where we, we find something different happening in the life of our Lord Jesus. Up until now, we have seen him healing people and also forgiving their sins. But now we meet a man who wasn't ill. At least he didn't appear to be ill in any way at all. His name was Matthew and he was a tax collector and he was simply sitting one day at his tax collector's booth when Jesus came along. And Jesus simply said to him, follow me and Matthew got up and followed Jesus now we're so familiar with this that we we may perhaps forget how remarkable this is here is a man just simply going about his everyday life and his business he's a tax collector and he's there uh, probably in Capernaum and he's there because people travel through and as they go on their travels they need to pay their taxes to the Romans and he's there to collect those taxes probably not a very popular person tax men and women never are very popular are they but he was doing a job and he was working for the Romans and he was just getting on with it and then Jesus came by and Jesus said just two words follow me and immediately without questioning without doubting Matthew got up and followed the Lord Jesus and his whole life changed from that moment onwards I think this requires a little consideration doesn't it we know that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made there is no designer who could ever plan or build a mechanism as intricate and balanced as a human body. There's no computer, however sophisticated it might be, that can ever be as fast and efficient as a human brain. And even when things go wrong, our great creator has so designed us that we get to know about it and we get to know about it pretty quickly don't we when something goes wrong in your body you know that there's something wrong because the way we have been designed means that we have symptoms symptoms of sickness so we might have a temperature or we might have pain we might have a swelling we might have sickness or aches and a whole manner of other symptoms and these say to us there's something wrong and if it's serious enough they say to us you better see a doctor which is what Jesus says here isn't it verse 12 it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick so clearly then the way that we've been made the way that physically we operate is that symptoms show us sickness. Not always, of course. Most dangerous sicknesses are those where there aren't any immediate symptoms. We know that. But nonetheless, we are in a body that says there's something wrong. Something needs to be done about it. And then we go along to the doctor and what we're looking for is a diagnosis. And then we're looking for a remedy. So we want to say to the doctor, um, tell me what's wrong and tell me how it can be fixed. And we always hope that that will be the case. But when the Lord Jesus was in the world, sickness was just as common then as it is today. It's part of our human condition, isn't it? That we from time to time have sicknesses. And the Lord Jesus met many, many people who had all sorts of sicknesses even in Matthew's gospel we've we've met a, a leper and we've met a paralytic 
as well as some more general comments about Jesus healing everybody who came with all sorts of sicknesses. And sometimes those sicknesses were sicknesses of the body, other times they were sicknesses of the mind, and other times they were sicknesses caused by demonic influences. There was demon possession as well. And the Lord Jesus healed all of these various illnesses, we're told. And that shows us that the, the Lord Jesus has deep compassion. He came to reveal God to us. And God is a compassionate God. And so the Lord Jesus showed that deep compassion for men and women and young people and children. You remember that he, he said, don't turn the children away. Let them come to me because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. The Lord Jesus was showing the infinite worth of the human being. He was showing us that we possess a soul that is so valuable and so precious. And yes, this soul is part of our body as well. And so he was concerned for people. He was concerned for what was happening in their lives. And he had a deeper concern too. His deeper concern, as we saw at the beginning of this chapter, his deeper concern was to diagnose and treat what is at the very heart of our human problem. That is why when the paralytic was put in front of him, the Lord Jesus did not immediately say to him, get up and walk. That was what the presenting problem was. He was paralyzed, but Jesus saw deeper. He knew that this man had sins that needed to be forgiven. He knew that fundamentally that man's problem was not his paralysis. And he was not even saying that the, the paralysis was caused by the sin. He was saying, you've got a deeper problem here that only I can deal with. And it is a problem of your sins. And so the Lord Jesus, he didn't simply come as a healer. He didn't just first and foremost come as someone who could heal people from their sins. We mustn't think that that's why Jesus came. We know he did heal lots of people, but we also know that there were many, many people in the world, far more people in the world at that time, who didn't get healed. There were far, far more people around the world in Jesus' day who never met him while he was on earth. And after all, the Lord Jesus only had a three-year healing ministry. So there were far more people who never got healed of their physical illnesses, which shows us that Jesus came to do something far more radical, far more important than simply heal a few physical diseases and enable people to just get up and get about their daily lives without the encumbrance and the, the difficulties of, of illness and disease. No, he came for something deeper than that. And that's why we have here in Matthew, in the calling of Matthew, the Lord Jesus dealing with Matthew's problem. He wasn't ill. He wasn't paralyzed. He didn't have leprosy. He didn't have any number of other diseases. He wasn't demon-possessed. But he still needed Jesus' touch. He needed his heart dealt with. He needed his sins forgiven. And so in this passage, what we see is the Lord Jesus revealing what our real problem is, and then showing us the way in which that real deep problem can be dealt with. So first of all, what is the deep human condition that Jesus came to reveal. Well, we see it here in this calling of Matthew in verse 13. Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And in saying that, the Lord Jesus is saying that Matthew was called because he was a sinner. Follow me, said Jesus. Why should Matthew follow Jesus? Wasn't he happy with his money? Wasn't he happy with his work? Was his life not in some ways satisfactory? Jesus said, follow me. 
There is something that you need, Matthew. And we may not be aware that this is our great need. Matthew may not have been aware of that until that moment that he met Jesus. And Jesus said, follow me. But Jesus was saying to him, Matthew, you are a sinner. And it's people like you that I have come to call. This sickness is a sickness of the heart. Sin is a disease that strikes at the very center of our lives and it affects everything that we do. In Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah speaks about this. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, where we read, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. The heart, that is where our problem is. Not the, not the human physical heart that beats and pumps and, and keeps us alive. But in a way, it's a lovely illustration, isn't it? Because our heart is essential for everything else. We have two of nearly everything in our bodies, don't we? but you've got one heart. But that one heart must do the work to keep blood flowing to every single part of your body. And unless your blood gets to every part of your body and feeds the body, you are going to die. It's central to everything. And when the Bible says that the problem that we have is a problem of the heart, what it means is that there's something central in our lives. There's something that affects everything that we do. It affects the way we think. It affects our behavior. It affects the things that we say. It affects everything. And this is called sin. And the symptoms of sin are everywhere all around us. Children's playground gets uh, built and within just a few days it's ruined by graffiti and vandalism perhaps even before it's officially opened schools end up having to become almost like prisons because they have to lock all their doors and not allow anybody in now why well we've seen haven't we the awfulness uh, in certainly in the united states occasionally even in this country. So we have to have security. People have to carry around with them personal safety security alarms for fear that they might be attacked. We find that young children are often out of control, even when they're very, very young. We find that the media just plays upon the, the bad things, the wickedness, the evil that is in the human hearts and seems to enjoy magnifying it and even glorying in it. And some of the television programs, they just love to exalt sin and to, to speak about all of the wickedness and suggest that it is just normal behavior. There are symptoms everywhere and we find those symptoms in ourselves as well. We find ourselves like the Apostle Paul saying, O oh, wretched man that I am. He says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the, the very things that I don't want to do, these are the things that I do. And I find myself trapped, he says, O oh, wretched man that I am. It's a sickness that ultimately will end in death, not just physical death, but spiritual death as well. Think of that man's paralysis, or you think of the other man's leprosy that we've already met in Matthew's Gospel. And these were serious illnesses, weren't they, that affected every part of their lives and all their relationships as well. And they're an illustration to us of what sin does. Because way back there in the Garden of Eden, the Lord God said to the man, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And death began to work in Adam and Eve the moment that they disobeyed God and they were cut off from his immediate presence. And although they lived for seven, eight hundred years after that, they did die, just as God said. And it's been like that ever since. 
Sin was Matthew's problem, even though it was not obvious, perhaps even to him, and certainly not to others, although there were those who didn't like him, no doubt, because of his job. But he did know when he met Jesus that that was his problem. Sinners. Do you know that that's your condition today? It's the first step in ever getting right with God is to acknowledge that you are a sinner. To come before God honestly and say, yes, I agree with your word. My heart is deceitful. My heart is desperately wicked. I am a sinner. That's what Jesus came to reveal in us. But the wonderful news is that the Lord Jesus showed us how this may be dealt with, how this healing may be obtained. Jesus is the great physician of the heart. He has authority to deal with sin. We saw that, didn't we, in, in the paralytic People look, looking on said, you know, who is this person? Only God can forgive sins. Who does he think he is? Well, he thought he was God, and he is God. And he certainly does have authority on earth to forgive sins. That's wonderful news, isn't it? That here is someone, just one person, who can actually deal with the heart of the problem, deal with our sinfulness. And he has authority to do so. How can he do that? Well, because he doesn't have the disease himself. See, part of the problem is that all of us, every single man, woman, and child living on the face of the earth, every one of us is suffering from this sin sickness. And if you're suffering from the illness, you certainly can't help anybody else. In fact, it's like a contagion. The more we try to help others, the worse it gets. We are in a desperate situation. The only person who can ever deal with our sins is someone who is not himself a sinner. And there has only ever been one person like that, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why he has the authority to come and deal with our sins. He came to earth for this very purpose. That's why he came into the world. We were reading on uh, Wednesday in 1 Timothy, a wonderful verse. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's why Jesus came. He didn't come to judge the earth. He did not come to heal. He came to save. That's why Jesus came. And his healing miracles are there to declare the fact that he can do it. If Jesus can say to a paralytic, get up and walk, then he can say to you, your sins are forgiven. Oh yes, you can see the paralytic getting up and walking. You can see that. That's obvious. It's not quite so obvious to see that your sins are forgiven. But see, that's why he did it. He did all these healing miracles, not just because he was a compassionate, loving man, which he was. He was compassionate and loving and caring, and he, he hated to see the effects of a fallen world. And that's why he healed people. But the main reason he healed people was because he wanted to show that he can also deal with the fundamental problem of your heart and your broken relationship with God and with everybody else. And so he says to paralytic, get up and walk, but he's also said to him, your sins are forgiven. And if, if he gets up and walks, you can believe that his sins were also forgiven. Jesus can do it, you see. How does he do it? Well, it was predicted long before Jesus ever came into the world. Way back in Isaiah and chapter 53, we are told exactly how the Lord Jesus will deal with our sin sickness. Listen to this, Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. In that one little voice, in one little verse, Isaiah is saying, that's what sin is. 
Number one, sin is transgression of the law. Sin is you and me breaking God's law. God says, do not, and we say, I will. And we transgress God's law. We break God's law. That's what sin is, transgression of the law. Sin is iniquities. It is that twistedness of human nature giving us a bent to do wrong rather than to do right. We are biased to do wrong all the time. Even from our youngest years, we, we want to do what is wrong rather than what is right. We are, we are filled with iniquity. And this creates a lack of peace in our lives. We aren't peaceful people. We don't have peace in our minds and in our hearts. We don't have peace with other people. We certainly don't have peace with God because of sin. And then it's this disease. By his wounds we are healed. It indicates that there is this disease that is affecting all of us. So how is it going to be dealt with? Well, we're told here in this verse, it was dealt with by Jesus Christ suffering and dying on the cross. He was pierced, those nails through his hands, that crown of thorns on his head. He was pierced. Why? For our transgressions. He was crushed. Remember him in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating great drops of blood, the intense internal pressure of what he was going to endure and what he was already enduring for your sins and my sins. He was crushed for that inner twistedness of our nature. He was punished because of our broken relationship with God. He was punished so that we might have peace. And the wounds that he endured, well, they brought us the healing from our sins. Jesus alone brings us this sin healing. And he has great compassion to administer the remedy. He's walking past Matthew's booth there, and Matthew is just getting on with tax collecting. And the Lord Jesus looks at him and says, there's a sinner. There's a sinner. And his heart went out to Matthew in great love. And he said to Matthew, Matthew, follow me. Follow me. I've come to call sinners. Follow me. You're a sinner? Follow me. You'll have your sins dealt with. And he does that for others as well. And then, see, Matthew brings all of his friends together, doesn't he? Verse 10, when Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Wonderful. See, Matthew is saying, something's happened to me. I was, just, I was just at my tax collector's booth one day, and this man came along called Jesus, and he said, follow me. And do you know, he has changed my life. My sins have been forgiven. And he said to all of his friends, I, he's coming round to my house. You've got to come and meet him. You've got to come and see this person because what he's done for me, he can do for you. Isn't that what we say? When we first get converted? You know, some of us are a bit long in the tooth now as Christians, aren't we? And, you know, when we were converted, it's such a long time ago, we can almost not, not remember it, some of us. But try and remember, how did you feel? when you were first saved. Didn't you want everybody to feel that? Didn't you want everybody to know? Didn't you tell your family and your friends? And yes, you got it wrong often and you were over-enthusiastic and you put people off, but who cares? You were so thrilled with what you had found in Jesus that you wanted everybody to know it. And that's what Matthew did here, isn't it? Because what Jesus did for Matthew, he can do for others because he came to call sinners. Come, ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is willing, doubt no more. And so Matthew brings all of his friends round and says, Jesus can do it for you as well. And he does. Have you been to Jesus for this healing? Do you recognize? You've got to recognize, first of all, that that is your problem. 
It's so easy for us, isn't it, to go through life and to constantly blame other people and say, it's not my fault, I'm not the one, it's everybody else that's wrong. And we try to blame it on our upbringing, we blame it on our education, we blame it on our social status, we blame it on our lack of this and our lack of that, and we blame it on the world and everything else. And the real problem is within the heart. And until we realize that, we're never going to come to Jesus. But praise God, Jesus comes to us and he says to you, follow me, follow me. And when, he, when we hear his voice, yes, he's not going to come to you at your workplace or your school like he did to Matthew. He's not physically present here, but he's still, by his Holy Spirit, he's still calling people today. And when he calls you, don't ignore him. Don't push him away. Don't say, later, one day. Perhaps, when I'm older, when I really feel a need of him. You don't know when Jesus is that close. You don't know that he's going to be that close again. But as you hear his voice saying, follow me, follow him. Leave your life of sin and follow Christ. Become part of the church of Jesus Christ. What is the church? In the end, there's lots of ways of describing the church. The Bible describes it as a, a temple, a flock of sheep, a family. There's lots of ways of describing the church. But you know, the church is a hospital for sinners as well. It's a hospital for spiritually sick people. And, and all of us come together and we come as sinners. And we come as sinners who know they need Jesus to save them. And you're always going to need Jesus, right until the moment you die. Listen to dear old Bishop J.C. Ryle. I found this so helpful. Sinners we are, he says. Sinners we are in the day we first came to Christ. Poor, needy sinners we continue to be so long as we live, drawing all the grace we have every hour out of Christ's fullness. Sinners we shall find ourselves in the hour of our death and shall die as much indebted to Christ's blood as in the day when we first believed. The church is a place for sinners. Matthew's house was a place where sinners gathered and Jesus was there. The church is a place where sinners gather let nobody out in the world ever think that we in the church have got it all sorted out and that we're all great people. We know that we're sinners. The difference is that we're sinners who have been saved by Jesus. And we know our sin and we struggle with our sin daily, but we know the grace of the Lord Jesus in forgiveness. And we know that one day we will be completely healed in the new heaven and the new earth. Is that your hope? Have you been to Jesus? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you followed him? Are you following him now? He's the great physician who alone can deal with your deepest problem. Don't push him away. Listen to his voice and follow him today. Let's sing our closing hymn. If you follow the Lord Jesus, if you know him as your saviour, you'll be able to sing this lovely hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fear. Number 152.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.